what does that mean? It's it's not like a, a full computer that's on your network, right? I mean, it, it is a computer in the sense that everything is a computer. Welcome to The Extra Dimension, the show where we explore ways technology intersects with other parts of our lives, which we like to call the technological convergence. I am your host, Ian R. Buck, and last month, Marie Kondo took the world by storm with a video series about tidying up. As I learned more about her philosophy on choosing what to keep, it occurred to me that she hasn't said much about our digital collections. And come to think of it, I hadn't seen anybody tackling that subject head on. So in this episode, we're going to talk about tidying up your digital life. Find the show notes for this episode of The Extra Dimension at thenexus.tv slash TED41. Oh, and before we get into the tidying up subject, uh, I would like to let you know that we have had a significant update uh, for one of our older episodes of The Extra Dimension. If you listened to The Extra Dimension number 27, which was the episode about DRM, we had a section in there that dealt with DRM as it relates to hardware, and uh, the Library of Congress has given us a, uh, a new law regarding uh, DRM and uh, and being able to repair items. So if you uh, want to hear that update, go back to the extra dimension number 27 and re-download it. Um, we have that update inserted into that episode. So the part of Marie Kondo's method that most people are have heard of and kind of focus on is the uh, step in which she has her clients uh, gather up all of their possessions and uh, and puts them put them into one place uh, and then start sorting through them uh, taking each item one by one in their hands asking themselves if it sparks joy and then if it does not spark joy in them in that moment, they, uh, they get rid of it. Um, well, first they thank it, and then they get rid of it. Um, she tells them that it is very important to sort by category and not by uh, location where it is stored. Um, and so as I, as I read this, as I learned this method, um, I started thinking about how it can apply to our digital lives. Um, First, the does it spark joy method of, of determining whether you're going to keep something or not. Um, I think that that works great for the digital things that we have that demand our attention. So things like push notifications, newsletters, playlists, subscriptions, social media accounts that we follow, right? Things that we are essentially trying to keep up with. Um, it is very, very important that those things uh, are, are, you know, not only like net positives in your life, but that they actually, uh, yeah, spark joy in your life. Um, the inspiration for this episode came at a very opportune time for me personally, um, because I had recently listened to an episode of the uh, Cortex podcast in which they were... Um, Gray and Mike Hurley, uh, they, they every year uh, come up with a theme for themselves, um, and it's, it's not quite like a resolution, a New Year's resolution, but it's more of a, like, here is one thing that I am going to focus on this year, and so all of my decisions, I always kind of have this thing in the back of my mind. Um, and, uh, and, and they encourage their listeners to go and come up with uh, themes for themselves as well. Not everybody has to have the same theme, of course. Um, and for me, for 2019, I decided that this was going to be my year of pruning. So really taking stock of the things in my life, especially the things that are taking up time in my life, and figuring out uh, which things I want to keep and which things uh, I don't necessarily need. And so incorporating this does it spark joy um, frame of reference into my year of pruning uh, has been a very, very good thing for me. Um, I have started very aggressively uh, 
go as I as I read through emails, um, evaluating whether or not I actually want to read new items from particular newsletters and you know various sources that autom- you know send me stuff automatically. Um, some of those I do want to continue to get uh, mail from, but the vast majority of them I realized I'm not really reading. I'm just see you know reading the the headline of the newsletter of the uh, of the message and I'm not I'm never actually opening them. And so uh, I have very aggressively gone and uh, unsubscribed from a lot of email sources um, that that were uh, quite frankly just taking up a lot of my time and energy. Um, notifications on my phone as well. Uh, I have started to utilize um, Android's feature uh, where you can selectively stop various categories of notifications, not just on an app-by-app level, but also categories within each of those apps. So, for example, um, Amazon's app, right? I do want to get notifications about shipments that are already being sent to me and get updates on those, but I don't really want the push notifications about, hey, here's a great new deal for you. So I have uh, started uh, just long pressing on notifications when I realize that, oh, this is from a category of of notifications that I don't really need in my life, uh, and just telling Android to never show me those again. Now, moving from things that are of the, like, update type, uh, to the things in our digital lives that are more like collections or archives. Um, for those, I don't think that the, using the Spark Joy uh, frame of mind to sort through them is going to work nearly as well because storage is relatively cheap um, and it is much, much easier nowadays to store everything in a way that it, it's out of your way, it doesn't take up any cognitive load, um, you don't have to think about keeping it, you know, nicely organized. If you, Once you have an organizational system in place, um, then you don't have to continually think about keeping things organized. And we're going to talk about some specifics about how to achieve uh, that ideal. Um, but yeah, once, as long as you are using a method that will keep all of your stuff organized for you, um, and since we don't necessarily care about how much space it is taking up, um, because the price of storage has gone down much, much faster than the amount of storage that we're using has gone up. Um, This allows us to keep a lot more stuff around um, and have it there when we want it, uh, but not have it get in the way when we don't need to be thinking about it. Now, if you're listening to this episode and thinking, gosh, I don't have an organizational system set up at all for any of my digital stuff. I feel very, very uh, overwhelmed by it all. I think that um, using Marie Kondo's method of taking all of your stuff and putting it into one place in order to sort, sort through it all can be very, very helpful. So transferring all of your digital possessions from cameras, external drives, um, downloading stuff from your social media accounts, scanning physical photos and documents in, um, and having it all in like one drive, one <laughs> one hard drive, um, and then looking through it, sorting through it, and choosing what to keep. I think that that can be a very helpful step. That's a pretty essential first step. Um, but if you already uh, have been rather intentional about how you have uh, set up your your digital possessions, um, I don't think that it's necessary to uh, go and, and um, aggressively sort through your stuff. Now, my mantra when it comes to our digital collections is I want everything to be in its proper place. To get a little bit deeper into that topic, let's talk to Brian Mitchell. Everything in its place. Who is one of the hosts of PodKit, another podcast here on the Nexus TV. Um, So you said logical place. I'll just say 
uh, that's that's the attempt. And what might be logical <laughs> for everyone is may not be logical for me and vice versa. So, as long as it's logical to you, it works, right? I suppose. I suppose. Um, so I, I got a new MacBook this last fall. So I went through the process of kind of resetting things up, and that that was a good way of, of checking what are files that I need and where are they and what what is synced, what is in the cloud, what is not. Um, and I'll start with what's not in the cloud because that's pretty. That's a smaller group of files, and that would mainly be <laughs> um, currently installed um, development that I'm doing. Now the source code and everything is is on GitHub and synced and through Git and etc. Um, sometimes on my blog, if I'm running a new blog post and I don't have it posted yet, I won't commit it. But lately, I've been committing that to a new branch, and then when I'm ready to post, I squash commit it, so it just is one commit with all the changes I made by the end. Um, mm -hmm. I find that there's nothing in there that I'm too private about. So whatever, if people want to look at my draft posts before I'm actually publishing them. Yeah, but then you can't use them as like Patreon exclusives. I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other things that aren't backed up are podcasts I'm working on. So that would be something like the recordings that um, I've made for myself. Um or maybe, maybe ones that I've downloaded from other hosts if I'm editing a podcast. And uh, mm -hmm. probably primarily the logic profile itself of a podcast I'm currently editing. So if something were to happen in that, like anywhere from a few hours to a week between recording and releasing a podcast, the project file has a potential of being destroyed if something terrible were to happen. See, that's funny because my setup is the opposite way. The The episodes that I'm currently working on are the only ones that I synchronize to like Google Drive. Uh, and that's partially because I work on multiple different computers. I, yeah. you know, I can never be sure if I'm going to be editing on my laptop or my desktop or whatever. Uh, and then once I have finished with the project, then I can move it out of Google Drive because storage in there is more expensive than storage that's just in my desktop here. Yeah, so you're using, or um, it being backed up is a um, like a bonus thing for you syncing your files. Yeah, yeah. I really should uh, put together a, a comprehensive backup, like long-term backup solution for my archive of stuff. That's a lot of storage. I, I feel like yeah. that's a, a philosophy about stuff too. Um, generally or many years ago at least, I stopped saving project files for any like videos I made or anything. Audio stuff I still have around. The thing about you know podcasts are they're a couple gigabytes in size for each project file, and that just yeah. it becomes a lot both to store and to just transfer around. I don't really care. Ultimately, a podcast, in my opinion, is pretty much, once it's up and there are no issues immediately with it, it's probably fine, and I'll delete all the source. Um, and you know if you need to cut anything, you can just pull down the MP3, cut it put some new stuff in and re-export you're dropping a little quality there yeah. but at the same time it's a podcast it you know it's not that huge of a deal in my opinion yeah and i'll and i'll also note my downloads folder is my uh is basically the only working folder i have on my computer that is a folder that i know isn't synced anywhere because yeah it's, it's everything i live out of I, I keep my downloads folder as empty as i can and anything in there is basically a to-do list of deal with this Mm. do this do that with it yeah but if i do yeah. want to save something um so say that would be a logic file or something i will just add it to the icloud drive um, i pay for 200 gigabytes per month um, because my photo library is also stored in icloud so i have a logic folder in there and i can put any you know podcast file or music file project that i'm working on and old ones i have synced in there as well and so that's nice to just have on any device i want to sign into um I used to be a big user of Dropbox, but I, I've pretty much moved off of that. Aside from one or two use cases, I uh, I use my Dropbox as like basically, I treat it as a thumb drive that I can just hand to somebody, right? So if I've got like a file that I want to share with somebody, but I don't want to accidentally like put it into my Google Drive and then forget that it's there, you know, because the Google Drive is the thing that I actually use on a day to day basis then I'll put it in Dropbox and then like, you know, at some point in the future, I give myself permission to just delete it. Yep. I've, I've used Dropbox for that as well. Um, let's see what, uh, my Google drive is another service I have. I've never installed 
that on my Mac as like an application that syncs things. It's always been mm-hmm. something I use through the browser. So the big things in there are um, Fog of World syncing. Basically, the Nexus folder is what I use Google Drive the most for um, occasionally. Yeah, because that, that's the only place that you can put Google Docs and spreadsheets. Yeah. So and, it, it, you it know. makes sense for that, for sure. Um, I used it as a, kind of a source for when I was a lighting designer. Um, mm. I used to have a bunch of cover letters I worked on in there. I've worked on my like an old version of my resume through Google Drive. I used Google Drive way more when I was in school, basically, because you can have multiple people working on documents. But I've pretty much stopped using yeah. that. Um, and and that's actually one of the big kind of challenges here is like choosing which which online like cloud storage service you want to use, right? Is like complicated by the fact that like okay, it's it's not a simple equation of like okay who offers the most storage for the least amount of price because there's also like cases such as google docs where it's a proprietary thing and we you know but it's become so ingrained in like the the like being able to collaborate with other people that that you know it's almost necessary like for for me it be- felt almost necessary to use google drive over any of the other ones because like if i want to have my one place where i can go for everything whether it's a file or a google doc or whatever like it has to be google drive mm-hmm. so that's uh, that's how they captured me <laughs> yeah and I, i've been trying to consolidate because i did especially when i was in college i used icloud drive a little i used dropbox quite a bit and i used google drive as well and i'm like there's so much stuff everywhere I mostly use iCloud these days. Um, I use Apple Music and iTunes Match to store my entire library. That does not count towards the Google Drive space that I have, but my photo library does. And so I pay for 200 mm-hmm. gigabytes a month. It's like 2.99 a month. Um, I don't remember the size of my photo library, but it's it's large. I've used like 120 gigs on my iCloud Drive account. Um, and so a bunch of iOS apps sync their data through there. My iPhone, my iPad back up to that that stores pretty much all the stuff that I need uh, for day to day. The The last thing that I have, which is I think a little different than the rest of you is I also have a NAS at home. So it's a network attached storage. Mm-hmm. It has right now, I don't know, like 10 and a half or something terabytes of space on it. Um, and can you, can you break down a little bit? Like what does, what is that? What does that mean? It's, it's not like a, a full computer that's on your network right i mean it, it is a computer in the sense that everything is a computer um yes. it, yeah it's 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 a server so there's no like screen or keyboard or mouse hooked up to it but it mostly just exposes a network share on your local network that has all the files that you have on that device for the whole network to use and so um, i'm able to load it up on my mac here i'm able to connect to it with my media server and so the nas stores a ton of media that I have as well as provides a place for me to store my long-term backups. So these are things like tons of old schoolwork and other documents. So I have like old just HTML and CSS websites that I built in high school. I have old Boy Scout documents, old schoolwork all the way back from sixth grade. Gosh, what else do I have? I have so much stuff in here. Some old banking things, old tax information, like car information, Basically, I'm what I'm. Oh, so I know where I know where to go if I want to break into your life. <laughs> Maybe. So I, it's basically all my like personal files that I've had over the years. Gosh, what else is in here? There's so much stuff. This is this is like a throwback. Oh, so like, uh, yeah, just old like old video and audio projects are a lot of the space in here as well as some like family video backups and basically every every digital content that I've created that I think might be just a teensy bit worth saving i'll dump in here in some in some mm-hmm. folder and this this could be sorted better for sure um but again i'm the only one who ever uses this so it doesn't really need to be better yeah i mean like and and what's the what's the indexing like in that system like how easy is it to find stuff you know if you if you think to yourself like oh yeah didn't i have like a play that i wrote in high school or whatever like how how easy is it to find that thing for you um if it's like a schoolwork item which is one of my more well sorted folders i have direct, uh, directories in that schoolwork folder that go 6th grade schoolwork 7th 8th 9th 10th 11th 12th and then i have mm-hmm. freshman 
uh, sophomore, junior, senior, and then tech crew. And so, and then inside each folder, especially in high school and newer, I have it broken up by semester and then by, and then by yeah. class. And yeah. then I have a few things that span outside of a class that'll store in there as well. And so it's very easy to just dive in and find what I need. If it was schoolwork, mm-hmm. other things, not as easily. Sometimes I'll search for it. Otherwise I'll just click through for a couple of minutes and I'll find it. Right. Right. And like photos is an interesting category because it, it it's similar to that in, in the fact that like, okay, these are things that we have created uh, and they're very, you know, they can be quite old and sometimes we want to go back and look at them. But typically like, unlike old school projects or documents or whatever, like, you know, most people want to have access to their photos you know, f- from their phone, from wherever they are. Um, and so you, you said that you've got those synchronized via iCloud, yes? My so. my photos library is synced through iCloud, yeah. I'm using the Apple Photos yeah. app. Um, now, there is an app for my NAS because my NAS is exposed to the internet and I have a domain for it and it's set up with mm. the security certificate and things like that. I can use um, an app on my phone and pull down any file on my NAS. And so that's mm. that's handy and I do use that sometimes. I've tried to replace what I used to use Dropbox for with my NAS for things like mm-hmm. the profile photo I use on sites I have in a folder on my NAS. And so I can pop in and get it there faster than scrolling back like two or whatever years into my photos library, which it exists there as well. Actually, yeah, I did create yeah. an album in the photos library with just that photo so I could find it faster. That might be better <laughs> to use. I don't know. Um yeah, I just have mine starred in in like Google Drive or whatever, so I can easily find yeah, it. Yeah, that's a good way to do it. So all of the stuff that I've just talking about is also backed up through Backblaze. So I have it set to synchronize mode, mm-hmm. and it, I think Backblaze stores anything within thirty days old and newer. So if if I change or delete a file, it'll be around for thirty days if I need to get at it again. Um. Oh, okay. So Backblaze isn't a forever one. It's it's a it's a rolling yep. backup. But if, if the file's on my NAS, it will be on Backblaze until, you know, until 30 days have gone by. So if I still right, have it right. on my NAS, it'll still be in Backblaze. Um, mm-hmm. I pay like, I think I back up a little over 200 gigabytes to that. And I pay like $1.20 a month to store all that. Now, if I were to download oh. it all, I'd probably have to pay $20, 30 $40 or something to download that. But that would be totally worth it to me because it meant I would still have all of this and I haven't suffered any big data loss or it will have meant I didn't suffer any big data loss yet. That, wow, that, that uh, business model almost feels like ransom. <laughs> it's, and Backblaze is the cheapest option. It's opt-in ransom. <laughs> but yeah, basically everything I have is synced in some way or isn't of high enough importance to be synced. Um, yeah, it's either synced or it's in your downloads folder. Yeah, but my downloads folder is backed up with Time Machine. <laughs> Right, right. So, <laughs> which is so funny. Let's talk a little bit about the concept of digital hoarding. So, digital hoarding is not a term that is medically or scientifically defined. Um, it's it's not in the DSM or anything. Um, but many people are becoming aware of it and are considering it to be a subcategory of hoarding disorder. So general hoarding disorder um, does have a a few things that it says that that kind of make it clear that it's only specifically talking about physical objects that people are hoarding, um, but the same kinds of uh, behaviors uh, have been noted in, uh, in a few patients Um, regarding their digital possessions as well. And one of the one one person who has written about the subject, uh, Joanne Orovec, who is a professor of information technology and business education at the University of Wisconsin Whitewater, uh, has said that it's it's not about necessarily measuring how many gigabytes of data that you're keeping around. It's more about whether you have an empirically supported sense of control over this data. So the the main symptom of digital hoarding is when you have a, an accumulation of digital files to the point of loss of perspective, which eventually results in stress and disorganization. And this 
is it a concern not only on the personal level but also on a business level um, because as people um, you know if they if they are hoarding information digitally uh, in the workplace as well um, businesses can find it more difficult to extract value from that information if there's too much of it to be able to effectively keep organized so with that in mind uh, given that it, it doesn't matter how much stuff you have but more about how much control you feel that you have over it um, I think it's very important for us to use systems that will um, do a lot of that work for us where where they it helps us to keep it organized uh, and keeps everything kind of out of the way until we actually need it now there are a couple of really good examples that I can think of this kind of thing. Um, the first being emails. Um, the traditional old school way of dealing with emails is uh, having the inbox simply be a, a reverse chronological list of all of the messages that you receive. And the, uh, the email client itself is doing absolutely um, no tinkering with the content at all. Um, it's just presenting you with you know all of the messages exactly in the order that they came in. Um, I think that that can work if you receive very, very few messages, but uh, I suspect that most of us nowadays uh, receive a lot more than that. Um, so the way that I treat my email inbox is uh, I, I do have Gmail's um, settings enabled where it will automatically sort messages into a variety of different categories, right? Um, and so, and it does a very good job for the most part of uh, knowing when a message that's being sent to me from a friend is actually, you know, an important thing versus a newsletter that's coming to me from, uh, you know, some entity that uh, I, I may be interested in reading that newsletter, but it's not something that I need to get to right away. And so what that allows me to do is it allows me to actually have push notifications enabled for my emails, which is something that a lot of people uh, when they when they first hear that they think oh my gosh Ian you're you're crazy to have push notifications enabled for your emails but um, the important thing here is that I only actually receive notifications for the emails that are in my primary inbox category I don't receive push notifications for all of the rest all of the promotions the updates the um, stuff that's associated with social media accounts etc etc um, so so it brings my attention to the things that actually uh, are important to me and that are time sensitive um, and then everything else just kind of gets out of the way and waits for me to come to it. The second thing uh, that, that I do with my inbox is uh, I treat the inbox itself as kind of a soft to-do list, right? If there are messages that are going to need further follow-up they stay in my inbox. Everything else, as soon as I am done reading them, if I have, you know, done any actions that are associated with that message, I archive them. I don't delete the messages for the most part because the storage is very cheap. Um, and emails don't take up very much space. Um, but I archive them, and so then they're out of my inbox, they aren't taking up any more cognitive space, and then if I do need them later, I can always search for them. Gmail has a fantastic search functionality. Um, it can find uh, uh, most messages very, very quickly. Um, the exception to this, um, I do delete messages occasionally. Um, I will go in and um, filter by um, any messages that are in the like promotions or the social categories. Um, that are older than like three months old, I will delete all of those um, because those uh, are, are not going to be relevant to me uh, later down the road. Um, but personal messages, things that are uh, updates, you know, so like any receipts that I get, stuff like that, um, I keep those around in the archive forever and ever because, uh, you know, I, I might need them in the future and they aren't uh, bothering me when they're in the archive.
The other example of a system that I use that allows me to keep a lot of information, a lot of data, um, but still keep it manageable is uh, my photos collection. I use Google Photos um, because it allows me to store my entire photos collection, um, but it does a lot of automatic sorting for me. It uh, recognizes people's faces and can group those all together. So if I want to find pictures of like one of my brothers, I can just uh, go into the search field, click on their picture, and then it will show me all the pictures that it has identified uh, of that one person. Um, I make sure that I keep all of the metadata um, very complete and accurate for all of my photos. So I can sort by the date taken, um, I can sort by location, I can sort by uh, all kinds of different criteria um, and find exactly what I need when I need it. Photo collections also add the challenge of uh, being able to easily um, share them with other people, especially like other family members, um, and Google Photos does a great job of that as well. For example, uh, you can automatically set up uh, particular albums to um, be shared with another person, and then you can um, set particular rules for new photos to automatically be added to that album. So for example, if, uh, if you and your spouse want to have all of the pictures of the, of, uh, the two of you and of like your children um, with each other, no matter whose phone it was taken on, um, Google Photos can, uh, can do that for you. Now, as I thought more about Marie Kondo's advice to only keep the stuff around that brings you joy, um, especially when I was thinking about how everybody got into an uproar about uh, her advice to get rid of uh, a large portion of your collection of books, um, it reminded me of the argument of uh, ownership versus access. Um, and uh, we did an episode of The Extra Dimension uh, a little while ago about uh, the access economy. You can listen to that at thenexus.tv slash TED29 if you're interested. And it also made me think about uh, something that I've heard my friend Ryan say quite a few times, which is, don't have files. Uh, Ryan Rampersad, who is apparently a grumpy old man, is another host of PodKit, uh, and so let's go and talk to him about his philosophy regarding uh, digital collections. I don't have personal files that I need to think about, worry about, or manage. Okay, in the so way that traditionally we all used to have or that we still do have. Right. Yeah, if, if this were like the 90s and you said that to me, I would think that you're insane. No, you would think that's okay because there's only five megabytes in my entire hard drive. <laughs> um, yeah, I feel like, I mean, did you did you start saying that because like that's kind of the, the iOS model is like, no, what, what are files? You, the user, don't get to know what files are. No, I would say it's quite counter to that model. I, uh, as you might know, am a software engineer, and so I use files a lot. But mm -hmm. I don't have personal files that I care about maintaining around. Right. So I don't have photos on a drive that need to be backed up 100 times. They're not here. I don't have them. Mm -hmm. I take pictures of my dog. I have the dog still, and I have some pictures there online. I have some printed out. They're fine. They're somewhere. But I don't have files of pictures of the dog on my computer mm -hmm. that I care about. So um, you've you've offloaded that like the the need to catalog those files yourself to Google Photos. In that particular case, yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So do you, so do you have a similar model for most of the digital things that you interact with then? You'd be surprised at how little I interact with things digitally. <laughs> uh I don't I don't um as you probably heard, I don't watch TV. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but if I did buy a movie or a TV series to watch, I'd buy a physical thing, um, uh -huh. and those just go in some cabinet somewhere later. Yeah, um, 
until you like let me borrow one and then it sits at my house for forever because I still haven't gotten around to watching the second season of The Expanse. That's okay. I never got around to reading the fifth book, but that's okay. Um, I, I and like so like personal documents. Like I have some documents. Like I'll have some uh, things that I've just written once or twice, and those just go and drive. And I don't, I don't have a lot of those, so I don't feel like it's uh, mounting up. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I feel like high school really trained us to very carefully like manage yep. a collection of documents and projects and things that we worked on. Yep. And now that nope. we're adults, we don't have to do that all the time. So for me, I uh, in, in in high school and before high school, really, even even going back to basically when I started doing computer stuff for fun myself um, in middle school. You know, I had a file structure, you know, there were, there was downloads, there was personal docs, there were ISOs, there were uh, zip files. Man, we're getting deep into it here. Yeah, whatever, whatever it was, I had a folder for it and the things went in the folder and that's, Mm -hmm. and they were date labeled or name labeled, whatever the case it might be. Um, I, I had a dedicated drive for those things locally. I had a network drive for backup that, and I used different backup tools over time. And, you know, being a kid, you don't actually have a whole lot of money to actually do online external backup. But yeah. I did try with Dropbox um, for the important files that I did want to preserve. Um, yeah, I don't do that now. I don't I just don't I don't care. Problem solved. <laughs> Professionally, a lot of my even even hobby wise, most of the things that I do care about to preserve are in Git repos. Yeah. Somewhere along the line. Which is which is like I think the perfect solution because the entire purpose of Git repositories is to be a management system. You know, it yeah. catalogs and you know organizes things and like, tracks the changes Even and better. tracks the changes. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I I noticed that you wrote down here. Uh, I used to be a feed hoarder, but then feeds died with reader. That that makes me very sad, Ryan. It does. It does. Uh, it does. It does. Yes. Yes, it does. Uh, I used to love reading my feeds every day, and I used to love adding to them and curating them and doing stuff with them. I don't. I don't really feel like I'm missing anything anymore. I'm okay with it. I've we've I've moved on. I feel like the industry's moved on. Yeah. Although, I mean, the 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 feeds that you definitely still have that I know you still have are your podcast feeds. Let's see if uh, that's true. Uh, let me open my phone oh no. and go to Pocket Casts. Are you oh, gonna blow my mind oh, right oh, now? They're still there. They're there. Yeah, they're, they are I, good. I, I okay, see. good. Yeah, there they are. Uh, all, <laughs> all, 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 quite a few. Not, not that I've actually been able to get out of um, like June of last year for some of these, but <laughs> yep, those are still there. Yeah, as so as in, in the spirit of feeds, yes, I still have some, but for regular text n- content, no, I don't do that anymore. Yeah, yeah, I've definitely been aggressively like you know as as part of my year of pruning, I've definitely been pruning out some of the feeds that I you know kept up with uh, in the past, and um, and part of that I think was was that. Uh, I fell behind on reading up on my on on web comics. Uh, at, since like you know, I had I hadn't touched them between Thanksgiving and like last weekend. And so then when I went back to start like catching up on some of them, I you know started thinking about like, okay, do I actually need to read this every day? You know, when they come out with one one right one uh, strip a day, and I'm like, eh, some of these I don't. Yeah, and then if you ever do want to read them, you just read like 20 at a time and it's fine. Yeah, except that if they're not in my feed reader, I probably will never just go and read them. And I'll, and that's and that's one of the things that I've also done, not just with file storage, but just with pretty much everything in my life. Like if I don't remember enough to know to go and do something myself, mm-hmm. maybe I just don't care. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. One of the things that you wrote down yeah. was about tab management, which yeah. I which I reacted to violently. Um, I wish you could have viewed it um, with with violent laughter. That is, oh uh, man, yes. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it was written here. Your browser should only have as many tabs as you can keep in your working memory, and <laughs> to which I wrote. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> so I, how many tabs do you have open right now, Ryan? I'm almost afraid to ask. So I don't use this computer for actually anything. Okay. This is just my recording computer and editing computer. Tell, tell me your but, laptop then. But my, my, my laptop where I work and I, uh, I do fun things with code, uh, where I need to Google things constantly and read docs and, and have multiple windows open for side-by-side -side comparison, I often have uh, five virtual desktops with you know three to five windows open and each one has a chrome window and most chrome windows will have oh i don't know between 10 and 20 tabs oh lord so maybe that is roughly about 100 tabs open at a, on a given day yeah do you have them at least like somewhat organized by virtual desktop like each one yes. kind of contains different topics di you know different collections yep. okay good so so each virtual desktop is there for a particular project mm -hmm. and each particular project is composed of an editor a chrome window for content and maybe another chrome window for just flipping to specifically for previewing whatever i'm actually working on mm -hmm. yeah so you're still better than my mom who i think has fewer tabs in total open on her chromebook but they're all in one window on her chromebook which is a and tiny they're all screen. out of order and they're, yeah well you can't tell the order because you can't even see the icons because the tabs are so tiny they're they're just they're just little points on yeah the mm. yeah you have some notes here about access versus ownership which uh yeah. Ties back into an older episode of The Extra Dimension uh, that we put out last year. That was a really fun episode. Um, how, how are you uh, viewing that in the, in the context of decluttering our lives here? Yeah, I, um, I don't think of, like, I don't, I don't, I'm not interested in many things specifically. Like, I code a lot. I work a lot, and that's it. That's good. I'm good. So, like, I don't have a lot of stuff that isn't for a purpose anyway. And so if something is for a purpose, I'm okay having it. It's not it's not clutter. Mm -hmm. um, so for the most part, that's fine. Now, access, on the other hand, is a scary, slippery slope. That I, and I stay away from slopes. Never going near them. <laughs> like, you slip right down them. And, you know, thinking that you can get away indefinitely with uh, accessing things that you like forever and you might think that, well, you're probably wrong because the rights will change, the service will go out of business, the media content type will explode and never be seen again, or who knows, something even worse could happen. At least if you own it and you have a physical something or another, you have a fighting chance of actually having that thing last for more than a day or a year or three years or five years. Like, there's a fighting chance for it. Yeah. Unfortunately, we also kind of change physical specs you know the 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 types of media players that we have you know like if you gave me a blu-ray right now i would have a total of one device that can play it right yes yeah however you could own it then like i could give you that blu-ray like that is a privilege by ownership given to me by owning something. Right, but like what like how much good does that do me if I can't watch that Blu-ray anytime and anywhere that I am? Don't be anywhere. Don't do anything. Don't see anything. Do nothing. Do less. <laughs> Access gives you certain capabilities for, you know, you know, when you're traveling, you can download your Kindle book anytime and read it anywhere. Sure, great, but now I can't give my Kindle book away. Right. Sure. I have the core here and I can give you the core. And if you don't have a TV, well, you can't watch the core. But if you had, if I had given you access to the core on Google Play Video Movies Player dot com Pro, then maybe you could watch the core. I guess the the important thing <coughs> here is that I'm not arguing ownership of a physical object versus access to digital. I'm arguing ownership of a physical object versus ownership of digital files uh you know and this is a, a wonky uh comparison because like the movie industry isn't going to give me a drm free mp4 right of, yeah. of the movie um but if i could have that instead of having a blu-ray player then or a blu-ray disc then that's perfect because that... well, my solution for that is to not support them at all yeah yeah, yeah, yeah online yeah. <laughs> at all. problem solved i don't watch tv and yeah and and you definitely bring up a good point about um, for access, like like things change, 
uh, a lot. And and like even in the cases where, um, you know, in, in the podcasting industry, like every podcast out there is is you know distributed like it in a, in a non-centralized manner right it's it's all drm free out of necessity because that's how the industry works um but even so like sometimes like feeds change and files are not on the server anymore. anymore and yeah. yeah so like like yeah if if i want to ensure that i have eternal access to my favorite shows like what am i supposed to do go and download every single episode of them and like hoard them on my hard drive just in case everything goes down and then like yep. roll yep, up my exactly own rss feed so that i can access them on pocket cast like what how absurd <laughs> i so you, you it sounds absurd you could say it is absurd, but that's exactly what you are capable of doing and should do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The internet is built yeah. in this particular way so that we are capable at the edges to perform whatever we see fit. And if we think it is wise to mirror content exactly as we hit it, cool, let's do it. Yeah, right on. It's expensive. It could be hard. could take a lot of time. Sounds like a great business opportunity. <laughs> hmm. Oh look, we've gone up back, right back to where we got away from. I, I guess the business opportunity there is like making uh, the internet, but blockchain. No, no, <laughs> anything but anything but that. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, it looks like we're on the same page about uh, pruning out email newsletters. Oh my gosh, I hate them. I hate them so much. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I follow a bunch of people on Twitter. Um, Brandon's friends known as the Twitter Illuminati or the React Illuminati. Sure. I'm not sure. Whoever they are. I follow a bunch of people and they all have their own special secret newsletters and they're obnoxious because I just I don't want a newsletter. Just just give me a blog link and tweet it every other week or whatever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh but they don't, and so I don't I don't read their content because it's a newsletter and email. I'm not doing it. Yeah. I mean that's that's an entirely uh I feel like that gets into kind of the the like media strategy uh, side of things as well. Oh, I know what they're doing, and I refuse to be a part of it. <laughs> um, but so even like um, like if I open my Gmail here, here it is, it's open. Mm-hmm. I have um, Target, I have Best Buy, I have Vistaprint, I have Pod Chaser, I have Micro Center, another Best Buy. I have a Corsair. I don't even know why. I have more Targets. I have a Microsoft. I have so many garbage advertising emails that I don't want, but I have. Yeah. I, I, so I, I, I routinely unsign up from them. Same. Yeah. I, I went through a huge like reckoning uh, last month where I just unsubscribed from like almost every single one that was coming in. Uh, and then what you can do with Gmail addresses is you can do your name plus additional text at gmail.com, and then you can give that away to you know different newsletters and you can track where your email address is being used Mm. so like for example if we wanted to sign up for um a newsletter from gimlet media as the nexus tv we could give them the email address the nexus tv plus gimlet at gmail.com and then anytime that we receive an email that is being sent to that exact address we know that oh gimlet are the ones that we gave this address to and yeah. then if we start getting emails from i don't know who just bought gimlet i don't know spotify if we start getting spotify ads that say the nexus tv at plus gimlet at gmail.com but it's branded spotify then we probably know oh i guess the privacy policy was totally ineffective and they lied to us yeah man that was a perfect example I think there are secret files in everybody's life that you just don't know about, you don't think about, and you don't know what you have until you lose it. Yeah. So sometimes... I think there's you, a song uh, about that. I don't watch TV, so I wouldn't know. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes when you when you have files, or it's not even files, when you have anything, you, you use it every day and you're like, hmm, this is great. I'm doing whatever I do. And then it's gone because your computer exploded or the server shut down or something happened and then then it's uh not so good anymore so if you like something have multiple and if you like something a lot make sure you can make it yourself very wise (laughs) 
Now, once you have all of your digital information nicely organized and put away, you're going to want to make sure that you don't lose any of it because you, you now know that you only have stuff that you want to keep. There are a few different ways to go about um, setting up uh, a backup solution, and nobody is more meticulous about this than Andrew Bailey, who is uh, one of the hosts of Control Structure, another show here on the Nexus TV. So let's go talk to Andrew about International Backup Awareness Day. So after you've you know got your organization figured out, mm -hmm. you want to actually back those up. So what I have, uh, you, you know, there's the AndrewBailey.com, which is essentially a computer in my basement. It, you know, not only does, you know, my blog, it also does file shares. It does SFTP, of course. Uh, everything on there is encrypted. It has a drive that is specifically for, you know, the file shares in there. Uh, four terabytes. So I pretty much do everything up here on my desktop. Uh, so, you know, every so often, like, you know, hopefully more than once a week or so, uh, I'm a little lazy on that. Uh, <laughs> uh, I have uh, a script that synchronizes uh, or at least pushes all the files on my desktop down to that file share downstairs. And that's just over the network. Yes. So the, uh, you know, uh, what is it called? The... Windows subsystem for Linux. Okay. Uh, I actually have a, a script in there that calls rsync. Uh, rsync is a program that, you know, it looks at a directory and it figures out, uh, well, it takes one directory and it takes another remote directory so it can, like, copy between them. Mm -hmm. uh, so if it sees, uh, like, a file in... Uh, in one place that it doesn't see in another, it'll copy it over uh, or delete it or, you know, whatever. It'll mm -hmm. make them all the same. So, good. Now, I got that, you know, on the file share downstairs. So, it's in uh, two places now. Yes. So, I have a external hard drive that I keep in sort of like a fireproof box. Mm -hmm. I take that uh, hard drive out of the box about every two weeks or so, let's say, uh, connect that up, uh, log into the server and, uh, you know, back up again, the internal file share drive to the external drive. Mm -hmm. So good. Now I got it in three places. And one of them is in a fireproof box. Yes. So, you know, that has, you know, certain qualities to it. Like say if the basement floods, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Great. So now you got it uh, in three places. You also have it disconnected. Mm -hmm. So that means that, you know, if, you know, for some reason Windows catches a virus up here and decides to, you know, delete everything or perhaps more likely encrypt everything right. uh, with its own evil key. Uh, Holding and, it for ransom. Yes. And asking me for like a Bitcoin to unlock it or whatever. Mm -hmm. Uh that I can just say, you know, fork you, I have uh, this drive in the box that has pretty much everything I care about. So let's say if I deleted a file that I might want to get back. Well, good news. I keep a, like, pretty much the exact same uh, external drive in my office at work. And about every month, I swap the two. And if there's something that, you know, I realize, oh, crap, I deleted, it's probably on there. Okay. So so that gives me another feature that, you know, not only is it disconnected, it's also off-site. Mm -hmm. So if, say, uh, my place burned down and the fireproof box wasn't exactly fireproof, yeah. uh, I still got my data somewhere. So there's that in... You know, just in case if things really, you know, mess up and like a fire sweeps through the, through the entire town or something. Mm -hmm. uh, I also uh, have uh, another drive, again, same model, uh, but at my parents' house, 150 miles away. 
So I guess that uh, once you've got your backup in multiple places that are hundreds of miles apart, the only thing that could really threaten all of that data is some sort of apocalypse scenario. Which makes me think, what kinds of excuses would my students come up with for not doing their homework if we uh, lived in a post-apocalyptic society? I did my homework, but the zombies ate it. I had to burn my homework to stay warm through the night. The demonic presence living in my closet said he would turn it in for me. My sister used my homework for weapon mastery practice. I accidentally exposed my homework to the toxic air outside, and the paper disintegrated. I had to train my textbooks for gasoline to come to class today. I had to go home and change because I got chocolate pudding on my favorite spiked armor. I couldn't get the book today because the books are has already been looted. I guess in a post-apocalypse world, the worst grade that a student in my class could get is M for And I swap that about every six months with uh, one of the others. So, nice. so that's like, what, uh, five copies? Yeah, and... And so that's, I like that it's like the same process each time. You're, it's just that it's like uh, decreasing the, the regularity with which you do it according to how far away it is. Yeah. So, you know, you got, you know, I got five copies of everything. Great. So that's quite a bit uh, better than in the 90s when, you know, it was just kind of shooting from the hip. And mm -hmm. if your hard drive crashed, well... You had to start over again. <laughs> we liked to live dangerously back then. Because ain't no one had the time to back up your hard drive onto thousands of floppy disks. Right, right. Uh, so I really like, you know, like the model of, you know, having multiple computers around and, uh, you know, detachable storage, let's just say. Mm -hmm. So, uh, which kind of the ultimate in networked uh, computers is the cloud uh, which I hear that you're a big fan of. Yeah, I like being able to offload like the the cognitive side of things uh, for these you know backup systems to somebody else. Um, and also like so so the system that you've got right has a, it checks a lot of boxes. It's it's you know multiple different copies in multiple different places, um, different snapshots you know with with different uh, schedules, um, but it you know you are the one who's doing every step of that. You have to remember to go and grab the hard drive from your work and then you know, um, and so I, I you know cloud cloud storage solutions uh, do all of those things and also just do it automatically uh the, the catch being of course that it costs more money than rolling your own solution uh there's that uh there's also one thing that i don't think we mentioned before there's also privacy concerns as well sure uh, with that yeah uh since you know you're essentially handing your photos off to google and say you know you know keep this safe and Google's like, okay, there's, let's see, there's this person in there, there's this other person, and I think she might be in there too. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and and I mean, I I consider that to be a feature. Uh, but if you don't, if you are very privacy oriented, um, you could just literally encrypt everything before you upload it to Google. Uh, th that would be possible. Yes, which is uh, what I like to do. Mm -hmm. So you know, along with you know the you know the hard drives in the local backups i also use uh, cloud storage rather selectively so you know both you and i have google drive mm -hmm. uh, we also might have uh, the service formerly known as sky drive <laughs> uh, but now OneDrive. Uh, i also have a, a box account with 50 gigabytes so i i mentioned encryption so mm -hmm. you know I have, you know, the big backup, but I also pull out selectively, say, the emails, uh, like the backups I get from Google, uh, which, you know, that's Gmail, that's, you know, other things on uh, Google Drive, uh, including our own Nexus uh, uh, show notes. Yep. Uh, I also, you know, put in, you know, like my financial documents, like tax returns mostly, uh, and also uh, my key pass database. Mm -hmm. uh, so like my password manager file. Uh, with, you know, I 
put that all in a zip file, uh, specifically a seven zip file, uh, and put it on, you know, these uh, cloud storage. So, you know, it's encrypted, so you can't exactly figure out what's in there. Mm -hmm. Uh, And just to be safe, I also uh, store the, uh, the key pass database separately. So like I don't have to open the open the seven zip in order to get to the key pass database. Nice, yeah. Uh, which which is you know a pretty good feature of you know key pass in that you know it doesn't have a cloud storage, uh, uh, cloud connectivity thing like say uh, one password or last pass. So that's like how you essentially navigate around uh, key pass not having an online storage thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so with that, you know, if something else, you know, blows up or becomes inaccessible, you know, I should still have it on my phone or my work laptop Mm -hmm. as well. So that's, that covers, you know, your music and your videos and your photos that covers, you know, cloud storage, but then there's, uh, video games. Yeah, uh, I'm yes. definitely not going to be uploading all of my video game uh, install files to Google Drive. Uh, <laughs> Unless you are prepared to spend a fortune. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and even then, it might not work. Uh, uh, Steam, at least. Uh, the backup facilities in Steam leave things to be desired. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, it has an official you know, way to do it, but I'm pretty sure you need to actually have it downloaded and installed before you can back it up. Mm -hmm. Uh, And even then, it's essentially focused around, you know, saving it off to DVDs, which these days you probably aren't doing. And I think I would suspect that they're probably DVDs that would also force you to, like, log into your Steam account before they allow you to do anything because Steam is a DRM scheme. So like they're not going to just give you a backup that you can use wherever you want without any sort of uh oversight. True. Uh that is why I like GOG, uh G O G. Uh so you know, their shtick is uh no DRM. Mm-hmm. Uh and lots of good old games. Uh so one of the uh, one of the other good features that I like is their GOG Connect program. Is uh, Sometimes, occasionally, they will have uh, games up there that will allow you... Uh, it essentially allows you to connect to your Steam account. And occasionally, every so often, it'll allow you to uh, essentially have games in GOG from your Steam account. Mm-hmm. So it'll look over there and say, oh, yeah, these you got a key for this game. We'll go ahead and copy it over here so you can have it in both places. Awesome. Uh, and then you can use the uh, the backup feature on GOG to download the, ins- the install files. You can do it straight from the browser. Uh, so you, uh, then you can you know, pretty much do whatever you want with that, uh, even include it in your, uh, you know, your local backups as well. There you go. Uh, let's see, Origin, uh, sort of has, a, a Connect-like feature, uh, so, for instance, you can put, uh, many of your older EA games, uh, into Origin. Uh, I don't think it has, like, a specific, uh, backup functionality, though. Um, although, say, if Steam actually went down, or Valve went bankrupt or something, you know, you, in theory, you can have a f- most of your games, maybe, in in other services yeah yeah uh so there are uh like a few custom backup scripts that you can get from say github uh i'm not sure if they even work uh but i have heard that say if you get a new computer and you essentially copy over the steam install folder over to the new system Mm -hmm. they will show up and you can use them just fine yes yes i i have done that before um essentially yeah because because i've had to reinstall like windows on this computer once or twice uh and at that point like the external hard drive that i have steam installed on is you know interpreted as oh you you pulled this hard drive out of a former computer and put it into this one um and as long as I know how to log into my Steam account, there you go. I have access to all of those games that are uh, on that hard drive. 
So maybe in theory, you could put that into your uh, local backup as well. Mm -hmm. Not sure how that would work. Um, so yeah, there's pretty much uh, my backup strategy. Nice. Now, sometimes you'll discover that the amount of space uh, available on your device is dwindling um, faster than you're actually putting stuff on there. Uh, typically, that is due to temporary files that should have been cleared out by programs on your computer um, or like caches that uh, apps have kept for themselves um, that aren't necessary for those to be uh, to, for those apps to run. Um, those kinds of things can usually be safely cleared out um, without uh, affecting the performance of your device. Um, so I would recommend becoming uh, familiar with your operating system's um, tool for clearing out that kind of thing um, and just, you know, using it every once in a while. Um, the best versions of these, I think, will uh, kind of prompt you every once in a while to clear out that kind of space so that you don't have to take the time to remember to do that. Uh, similarly, you can definitely start to uh, fill up your hard drive uh, just by downloading files every once in a while and uh, never clearing out your downloads folder. I particularly like to use my downloads folder as kind of a temporary folder. Um, so as as I download things uh, and uh, and use them, um, if they're items that I actually want to keep on the computer, I will immediately move them to whatever folder I ultimately want them to be in. Um, but if I just need to download them in order to work with them for a moment, and then I, you know, leave and I, and I go do something else, um, then they'll stay in the downloads folder. And in that way, uh, I can ensure that at any time uh, I can just uh, select everything that's in the downloads folder and delete it all, and I know that I am not losing anything important. This last one is a little bit morbid to think about, but it is important to make a plan for what you want to have happen with your data uh, after you die. Because as more and more of our lives are being, more and more of the important things in our lives are being stored uh, digitally, the legacy that we leave behind is going to be largely contained in those digital collections. Um, so not only are you going to want to have some sort of statement about what you want to have happen with your data, um, for example, maybe I as a podcaster would want to have a plan in place for um, keeping these shows online for as long as possible after I have died um, because, you know, who is going to be there to pay the bills to keep the website online, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but also uh, making sure that somebody actually has access to manage those kinds of things. So making sure that you um, have uh, a list of your passwords um, somewhere in a secure location, or at least um, listing access, uh, listing the password for your password manager, so that somebody else can go and access all of your uh, all of your accounts. Um, and uh, and having a statement about what you want to have happen with all of your personal information, that kind of thing. Um, that's uh, that's definitely a, an essential part of of managing your digital collections. Thanks for listening to this episode about tidying up your digital life. I've been your host, Ian Arbuck. You can find me on Twitter as Ian Arbuck. The Extra Dimension is released under a Creative Commons attribution license, so feel free to use any part of it as long as you link back to the original page, which is thenexus.tv slash TED41. Many thanks to my guests who came on this episode, as well as thanks to my friends who helped me to come up with uh, those post-apocalypse homework excuses and many many thanks to my students who dedicated their voice talents to uh, bringing those ideas to life 
This type of episode is one of my favorites because it has encouraged me to make some su substantial changes in my life regarding how I treat my digital collections. If you have been inspired to make any changes in your own life, uh, why not come and discuss those with other listeners and with the hosts over on our subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash the nexus tv. If you enjoyed some of the tips in this episode and you would like to help us financially as we continue to create thought-provoking content about technology, feel free to go to our Patreon at patreon.com slash TV. And uh, over there you can also get some good rewards, such as uh, day one access to The Fringe, which is our behind-the-scenes show where the hosts banter before and after our uh, actual recordings. And until next time, have a good one. The Nexus. The Nexus. The Nexus TV. Podcasts from, from the, the Technological, technological convergence. convergence. We're presented with so many choices in our lives. How do we make sure we're making sound decisions? By getting a second opinion from an informed source, of course. Lucky for you, the hosts from across the Nexus use lots of hardware, software, and media and analyze them on our show, Second Opinion. From reviewing the latest phones and laptops to pitting apps against each other, we've got you covered. Find us on our website, thenexus.tv, or by searching for Second Opinion Reviews in your favorite podcast player.